Thank you. I hope you'll forgive me for trying to give myself a bit of a break tonight. I knew I was here with these incredible women, and I'm not going to talk about the T word. I'm going to try really, really, really hard. So it's going to be a really boring, bland speech. I've also got the worst cold I've ever had in my life, so I am sorry if I kind of splutter through this. But Okay, so it's a real honour, albeit an incredibly daunting one, to be asked to speak here tonight alongside these amazing women. Alison Bailey was already a superhero in my eyes, but after hearing her speak in this very place this, this time last week, even more so, and I don't know how many of you were here and, and saw that speech. I hope it will go on YouTube or something soon. Most of the women on the panel are absolute experts in criminal justice, people I greatly admire, who have been leading policy and conversations on reform for years. So when I was asked to speak... I panicked and had the usual female bout of imposter syndrome, asking myself, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not an academic, I left school at 15, what on earth do I know about criminal justice policies and reforms? But then I realised that I am a woman, I'm a single mother, I'm someone who knows a little bit about how the slippery slope might just be the only one available to many women. There are a million potholes for women dotted along those slippery slopes. Choices are usually between yet another rock and yet another hard place. The exhaustion of routinely feeling down the sofa cushions or promising yourself that this is the last time you'll borrow from the children's space rocket money box because things will get easier and because they just have to improve soon. Hiding behind the door from the bailiffs, I do know a little bit about some of those things. And since I was elected in 2017, I've met with so many NGOs and charities and lobby groups, all advocating for women, for victims, all so kind and well-meaning and determined to bring about change. But I think it probably does make a difference when the people that you're talking to can at least have some grasp of what it feels like to find yourself in some of those traps and fall into some of those potholes. And the single biggest trap of all is, of course, poverty. Women with no agency, no choices, and nowhere to turn to. All of my life, I watched inspiring, passionate politicians on television, including those that made a real difference to my daily existence by creating tax credits or sure start centres. I never imagined while watching them from my tiny, leaky, two-bedroomed house with my two children that someone like me, with no academic qualifications, no assets, no agency, would get there myself. Women who have known nothing but poverty, neglect, violence, abuse, how can they ever hope to get out of their traps? The women who end up in prison will have had just basic survival on their minds all of their lives. They don't get much time to indulge in political activity. They won't have the headspace to care who we are and what we're discussing here tonight. That's why it's even more important that we are doing so. I have some brilliant activists in my constituency concerned about air pollution, green spaces, asylum seekers, and lots and lots of emails at the moment about crap floating in our seas. <laughs> and I love how much they care and dedicate their time and skills to campaigning. But the voiceless women in prison are never likely to do that. We have to advocate for them. It's our duty as feminists and it's our duty as those with a platform who influence legislation. The women we need to speak up for have been let down all of their lives, an underclass of damaged children who became damaged adults. As WP UK tweeted today, 80% of women who've been sentenced for a non-violence offence are in prison. 70% of women in prison are survivors of domestic abuse. 90% of children of imprisoned mothers have to leave home as a result. It shouldn't be radical in 2021 to, to want to stop women ending up in prison because they're poor, should it? It shouldn't be radical to want to stop abused, trafficked women from being locked up. As the winter draws nearer, we might settle down to a good Dickensian TV drama, watching as at least one character in fingerless gloves languishes in a dank debtor's prison. But let's update the system and stop locking up poor women now, still. As a legislator, I'm here to learn from you as experts. How do we make a difference? How do we empower and value these women? 
break them out of their cycles of poverty and abuse and take care and responsibility for them without just throwing them somewhere out of sight. If we can change these Dickensian practices, then we must. Let's at the very least, as a bare minimum, keep prisons single sex, keep biological males out of those spaces. Thank you very much. <laughs>